Welcome to our second speaker series for uh, 2023. And for those of you who don't know who we are, 51 Invest is an initiative of 51 Labs, and we facilitate efficient deal making and matchmaking opportunities by trying to increase access to capital for Iraqi entrepreneurs. And every month we conduct this webinar as part of our speaker series. And we're trying to increase awareness about the different types of investors, the different types of investments. We invite regional and international and local investors to talk about their knowledge and share their experience. We also invite Iraqi and regional founders to discuss their success stories. So this month, we have a really exciting session. We're going to look into Aristide's latest investment deal. And we're pleased to have with us today Mr. Ammar Shubar from Management Partners and Mr. Ahmad al Gramli, the CEO and founder of Aristi. Our session will look into an angel investing and into Aristide's fundraising journey. Um, the format is that it'll be a 45-minute discussion and then 15 15 minutes for us for a Q&A with the audience. Uh, make sure to follow us online on Twitter and LinkedIn. And this session is going to be live streamed on Facebook. So, Ahmad, would you like to take it from here? If you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to have the chance to, uh, to speak about Iraq, the tech startup scene, and uh, about Oristi. Uh, my name is Ahmad Shuba. Uh, I'm a partner and co-founder of Management Partners. I'm uh, originally um, from Iraq, uh, born in uh, Baghdad, uh, raised in Germany, so grew up in Germany, started my career there at McKinsey as part of uh, what they called the Business Technology Office, so looking on digital strategies and high-tech industry and telecommunication. Um, then early on, uh, basically, moved then in my career to the Middle East and worked across the region before we um, then founded Management Partners. And uh, Management Partners, we provide uh, management consultancy services around economic development, uh, corporate and business strategies, as well as, uh, as business and technology transformation. One of our key markets where we have been working in for the last 10 years is Iraq. And so we have been engaging across uh, sectors, a lot with the public sectors, helped international organizations and firms to uh, find their market entry into Iraq, uh, but also uh, helped uh, government and private sectors on their digital transformation journey. And we have seen basically more and more activities in terms of digital transformation and facilitated uh, from startups across the region, as well as in Iraq, basically entering into the fintech uh, scene, e-commerce scene. And so that's why we are excited about uh, the opportunity in Iraq, about uh, the green field of uh, the market when it comes to uh, digital services and um, startups there. And uh, where we are basically passionate about that in terms of helping to develop the country um, as well as basically from the opportunities which are there in the country itself. And so I'm glad to be here and um, yeah, to engage in that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. It's our pleasure to have you. Ahmed, could you give us a few words about yourself too? Thanks for the invite. Uh, my name is Ahmed Karimli. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Orizdi. We started Orizdi in 2019 in Feb, and we launched it in May 2019. Uh, I've been involved in um, in the business world since like 2003. Started like uh, one of my first businesses, and and I've been into so many different industries like uh, stationery, computers, software, and hardware. Uh, kids playgrounds, uh, gaming, uh, video gaming, uh, and restaurant business, and and several other industries. Um, I'm also a number one international best-selling author of a book called The Efficient Preneur. This book hit number one international at five uh, at the first week of its launch at in five different Amazon stores. Um, I also get involved in mentoring some business owners or startups, like involved with Misc Saudi and. 
uh, also mentoring at your program, uh, working with some Iraqi startups. Uh, so I also enjoy that. Um, and yeah, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, I mean, I really enjoying uh, those conversations on, on Iraq and the potential and, and, and hope we can add value to the listeners. Thank you so much, Ahmad. Um, if we can turn back to you, Ammar. So a lot of us here are probably not very familiar with angel investing. Can you please tell us a little bit more about it and how does it work? How is it different from institutional investing? That's a good question. So I think, um, so how it works is basically you have um, entrepreneurs like Ahmed approaching uh, basically people like me who are interested in the digital scene and asking them for money. Right? It's, it's basically mm -hmm. as simple as it gets. Um, so, um, and uh, I mean, the idea behind that and the difference between institutional investors is that um, angel investors usually come at, uh, at an earlier stage than institutional investors. Uh, so, um, and it's mostly in the pre-seed round or the first seed round uh, where the ideas are, let's say, more uh, not as clear as they might be or as institutional investors would require. And the role of an angel investor is to help basically in the initial phase uh, of basically getting the company to start uh, and to basically get the first funding for a proof of concept to basically get ready for institutional uh, investors, uh, as well as basically provide a, a little bit more of uh, guidance and advisory to the startups in which directions to go. And that's again, depends on, on the size of it. Uh, to help them basically put in the right governance, to uh, help them guide in their strategic directions, cementations, as well as basically to make them ready for potential institutions and investors later on, and to support in connecting them with other angel investors or institutional investors in order to, to help in the, the growth parts, right? That's basically the, the main idea and the role ideally an angel investors would then play. So right now you touched about two things. First, uh, about how Ahmad connected with you and also um, a general why are angel investors interested in investing? So uh, the motivation to do that. Maybe you can start by telling us what motivates you to, to be an angel investor and, and then we'll get to how did uh, Ahmad connect with you? Sure, I mean, uh, I'm personally motivated because I love technology. I love digital innovation. Um, I'm basically, I also love to, to support uh, the private sector and economic growth in Iraq. So basically these are basically two, two loves crossing each other. And that's basically how that uh, investment child was born, right? Because I, I am interested in supporting technology startups in Iraq saw that there's an opportunity and uh, where it could have impact uh, for the country as well as the financial reward because it's still a greenfield market where um, there is higher risk but there's also higher reward potential. Okay, and, and so what got you interested in RSD? I mean, there are other startups in, uh, and that are as successful or as RSD. Why did you choose RSD in specific? What made you motivated to invest in them? So the motivation basically were across a number of lines. One that uh, I like Ahmed uh, with his pragmatic approach in order to basically get the business started. Uh, they less focus on developing or redeveloping basically already existing technology, but they basically focus on building the business using uh, whatever is basically defined and customizing that to the, to the market. And with that, they basically focus the, the money and the spending on what matters, which is basically creating a business, 
not necessarily recreating uh, and developing a technology stack, which is not what at the end is the value of the company itself, right? If you are talking about an e-commerce company, only the customization and the adoption of that. Uh, he was able to convince other um, like-minded investors, which basically then also motivated me into co-investing. So if I would have been alone, um, I would not have been comfortable basically to invest and see that I would be able to, to help or risk be to get to the next level, which is required in order then to fully take off. Um, and last but not least, his persistence. So he reached out and never gave up. So kudos to him on that. So basically what I hear you saying is, first of all, it was Ahmad, the, the person. So for, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's, in, it's important to know that investors are interested in you as a person. How smart and savvy are you? And also when you say persistence, again, that's Ahmad as a person, that he's, he's persistent. He was able to create trust and bonds between the different investors by onboarding them and, and making them co-invest. And plus his savviness by um, creating efficiencies in, in operations and not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us more about the actual investment process? Um, how did the negotiations go? How was uh, the valuation? Um, how did, when did you meet the other investors? Yeah, so, so I think we, uh, we had a very open and frank discussion when it comes to the valuation and basically um, at that time, Oresi already generated revenue and had a revenue uh, projection. So we looked into that. Uh, we looked in terms of what would be an acceptable multiple based, based on that and given the risk factors in Iraq. Um, and once we basically had an initial interest and says, okay, there could be a potential uh, uh, for, for investing, uh, for us was then key to see who are other investors uh, minded because at the end of the day you want to make sure that an investment round has happened so it's not uh, just one one investor coming in but basically multiple investors so that the uh, startup has enough cash um, in order to fund the next uh, 12 months of operations ideally right and that's growth plan so uh, and um, so I asked Ahmed to set up a meeting with the other interested investors uh, with whom we met. And we then basically had the second uh, negotiation interaction round as, as a group of investors and directly with Ahmed uh, to, to add on. And uh, there we basically then discussed more of the detailed uh, investment terms in terms of uh, the valuation, in terms of certain uh, rules which we wanted to include as part of the shareholder agreement, uh, what were basically certain conditions in terms of reporting, uh, salary levels, compensation, and so on, uh, which then basically are the details to, to make sure that we have the right governance structure in place once we basically place the investment. Um, and what does that mean? How involved are you or will you be in, in the operations of Aristi? Or are you just more on a macro level and not engaged in the day-to-day -day, um, activities? Yeah, no, so, so we are not engaged in the day-to-day -day activities. I think that we would have a problem if we would be engaged in the day-to-day -day activities. So I personally, I'm uh, basically part of the board. So as part of the board, we have regular meetings uh, with Ahmed in order to uh, review overall progress updates uh, on the development and basically to vote on overall shareholder matters. So in terms of uh, capital raise, in terms of other important matters which needs to be escalated and requires a shareholder vote, that's basically where we're meeting on a regular basis uh, in order then to, um, to help guide the discussion the funding as a growth of the firm. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so, Ahmed, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us, what are the latest developments in Oristi? What are some new product launches, um, sales channels, new markets, partnerships? Give us all the juicy updates, please. We continue to focus on our winning categories, like in general, like beauty, perfumes, uh, appliances, uh, because that gave us kind of a, a niche uh, efficiencies. However, like when you still land on our store, you see it as a broad, we have over 40,000 SKUs in the store. Uh, but we focused on certain uh, winning categories for us that um, created a niche for us and uh, improved our efficiencies in terms of like, burn rate in terms of uh, margins uh, to get us closer to the break-even point because uh, we believe we are very close to that uh, and we are growing really well now like um, last two months we grow about 15 percent month on month um, and we we were trying to push to to maintain this uh, growth um, new thing we added uh, cross-border commerce which is a new thing for RISD we didn't start with cross-border like we were focused only on our business model was focused mainly on having products in Baghdad and, and, and we we deal with suppliers in Baghdad that have the products in Baghdad and we cover all Iraq in terms of uh, delivery and shipment. Uh, but we added a new element, which is the cross-border commerce. Uh, we saw uh, some opportunities and there are already some players in Iraq uh, in this niche, uh, but we did it, we saw some problems that like, you know, some not so much transparency in terms of the shipping rates to Iraq. So we wanted to kind of change that. And 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 uh, so basically now we started uh, shipping from Amazon.com uh, in the US to Iraq and uh, we started receiving orders. And uh, we plan to expand to, uh, you know, more store, more like we can ship from any other stores as well in, in the US, but like we are focused more on Amazon. Um, and we plan to open new uh, countries like UAE, uh, China, Turkey, uh, but we are taking it step by step so we can just um, fix it, optimize and fix any challenges that we might face. Um, and that's basically like, you know, the update for, for what's going on now. So the cross-border commerce, Mabruk, uh, actually this is, as you mentioned, there are already a few players and this is really in high demand. I think in a lot of Arab countries, it's in high demand. And from what I understood, your current market right now is the US, specifically Amazon, right? Yeah, we focus on the US. We can ship from other anywhere in the US, but like okay. we, the, the way, the different way we did it is we didn't list those sites to give access to uh, the customers to see those sites through our, our uh, website because the other players in the market, they do that and they usually have problems with shipping because like they open up lots of, you know, yeah. all those big sites to the consumers. And when the consumer orders something, then they face an issue with the shipping or like there is not so much transparency in terms of mm -hmm. uh, the pricing of the shipping. So we selectively up upload specific products that we know oh. how to price them in terms of shipping into our platform. And uh, also we receive links from someone if, if the products are not listed on our website we allow them to like we are open to receive links to 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 price them separately. Uh, but of course, this process is not as efficient as like when they just see it on our website, add it to cart and check out. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. Great. Um, so you tell me about your, your uh, investment journey. I want to hear about all the creative ways in which you've uh, um, in try to raise investment and how do you approach your investors? How did you approach them with this current raise? What was the process like? Actually, like we continue to learn, like each round is a little bit different. Uh, the recent round, like as board uh, and with the help of Ammar and, and the rest of the board members, we we kind of designed the, the round in a, in a very different way with a more uh different like we started in iraq because of the difficulty and the challenges of raising capital in iraq we started innovating in this space however it's not our space as a startup but like we created a document in in in, in with a certain system 
to kind kind of incentivize the investors who are going to come in first uh, early with a certain like extra shares. Uh, we uh, created certain deadlines and structure for for the round to make it work based on certain percentages. Uh, and based on the experience of the previous rounds, like uh, because raising capital, I believe in Iraq is is one of the it's very difficult. Like because people from the outside and the VCs they think it's it's out of their mandate of investment in general. Um, but there is a huge opportunity in Iraq. It's forty five million people, uh, growing population, uh, big purchasing power. Um, but I believe the ecosystem have developed a lot in the last uh, four years. So now the new startups with the, 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 that they would like to raise, let's say fifty to hundred thousand dollars, it's not as difficult as, as of the time that we started. Uh, but we, as let's say one of the top five startups or ten startups in Iraq, uh, in the front of the battle, like we we are kind of carrying the ecosystem on our shoulders, trying to develop it. And, 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 and always when you're in the front, you face more challenges because you want to raise bigger ticket uh, money for the rounds. And, 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 and usually that's not so easy in Iraq. Like most of the Iraqis, uh, Iraqi investors think in a very traditional way in terms of investment, like, you know, real estate or, or traditional businesses uh, still tech startups is a new thing for them uh, not necessarily they understand that there is a uh, those startups usually lose money burn money at the beginning to to grow to a certain level to break even they don't have the patience uh, they like they might ask you like okay i'm gonna put x amount how much i'm gonna receive in six months and when i'm gonna get my, my money back in six months or uh, and usually that doesn't work in startups. So to educate also some of the investors and it's and in terms of like angel investors, there is a very small group like uh, Iraqi, uh, the Iraqi angel network uh, and um, uh, Iraqi, uh, uh, you know, the other group of, of uh, Iraqi venture partners, uh, which is the other group of investors. Um, so it's developing over time. It's challenging. Uh, some of the ways that we use, like usually, like we have an email list, we communicate, we reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, we maintain the relationship because sometimes you you pitch an investor, but like not necessarily they will invest right away. Sometimes it takes them six months, a year, two years. Uh, with your continuous follow-up with the investor, they can see your progress. Uh, you, they can see if you have delivered on some of the things that you said or mentioned before previously that you will deliver on. Um, they know you more. They ask probably about you, other investors or some people in the market. Um, it's a very long, it's a marathon journey. It's not a sprint to to raise capital. And it's it's in Iraq, it's more challenging and, and slower sometimes. Since you already brought up the topic, uh, I think we should go from there. First of all, you mentioned the pressure, right? So there's a lot of pressure um, on you because you're one of the you know, first uh, startups in Iraq to receive institutional funding. And all eyes are on you, whether it's from the startups or the investors or the regional investors. And we're also talking, and you also mentioned um, investors still being risk averse. And I, I feel this is a situation that not only you, but a lot of the startups are facing right now, especially that everybody, every investor is looking for the success story to happen now, the exit to happen now. And maybe they don't understand that it needs to be five to 10 years down the line. It cannot happen now. Um, how, uh, how do you see this? How are you handling this, this pressure? And what, what do you want to tell the investors themselves? We also talk about educating them. Do you think this is maybe not, not the time for them? Do you think they're still behind and, and they still don't understand this ecosystem and how it works? I think investing in startups is the riskiest type of investor in the portfolio of the investor in general. But like the, the investor, if they have, let's say, $10 million, they need to diversify their portfolio, like summons the stock market, summon the real estate, summon a business, 
that they probably own and 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 a little bit in a in a startup like probably one percent or less or two percent or it depends on their appetite for risk and 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 their strategy of of investment uh but i think it's it's a it's also a gate for them to get data about certain sector in the market so if there is someone who owns a hospital they i believe they need to invest like in a in a health uh, tech startups to understand more about how do they do the data how they do like how they collect data in the market um and and and, and that's what i believe they should do uh, now uh, we reached out to so many vcs in the mina region and uh, most of the reply was like they're super impressed by our units of economics it's much better than other uh, startups in the region uh, with a similar size but uh, usually they they don't invest because iraq is out of their mandate of investment however we saw some movement of like you know investing in some startups in Iraq, like, you know, and, and some regional, like Belly or like some regional investor uh, startups started opening in Iraq, like Talabat or Karim or others. And usually those startups, they have uh, VCs already involved with them. So I believe the investment game is also kind of a jealousy game. So when they see some other investors in Dubai, when they see some other VCs have entered Iraq, they will start like, you know, okay, what's going on in Iraq? Let's have a look. Let's see what's the startup, how is the ecosystem? um and um, that's how it starts so i believe like in the coming one or two years we will see more vcs coming into iraq and i believe vcs they need to open in new markets for startups after the major three markets which is let's say uae saudi and turkey i think iraq, iraq is the nominee to be the fourth market because we have a big population big purchasing power uh, plus, I believe the risk of, as I said at the beginning, like investing startups is the most type, the riskiest type of investment. But at the same time, uh, I believe the risk of Iraq is way less than the risk of the startup itself. So if you invest in a startup in Silicon Valley or in Dubai, I mean, the risk of uh, the startup uh, or Iraq is way less than the risk of a startup going back, bankrupt. So why not investing in Iraq? Plus, the other attractive thing is the valuation. I mean, the startups with the same size probably valued from 20 to 100x uh, somewhere else, but like in Iraq is way cheaper. So that will decrease the, the, the risk level for the investor. So why not investing in Iraq? Why not? And, and the upside is huge if things work uh, in general. The competition is less and the valuation is, is, is very small. Okay. One more and, and to the point, and, uh, hmm. yeah, sorry to cut you off. Like to the point of like the pressure of like you know and the responsibility. Yes, we do feel responsible about like you know we are not only representing RSD, we are representing this Iraqi ecosystem, and we have to keep going because like some small startup probably learning from our journey, and we are learning from bigger startups. So we need to keep going until we uh become profitable or there is like some you know uh, other opportunities of probably MA or merger acquisitions yeah it's a, it's a lot of pressure um but you're doing a great job so <laughs> um how will you deploy your latest funding and what are the next steps um how are you going to use this uh, uh this raise uh we're gonna develop our team like we we before the round we were like around 17 people now we are around 22 people so we developed some you know we closed some gaps in the team uh we're gonna invest uh more in our marketing formula uh, which has been working for us for four years and uh, we added new marketing channels that we used to we, we were not using before and it's worth working also for us and um so yeah, mainly marketing team, um, a little bit of research about like, you know, and we opened this new channel of uh, cross border and uh, we're going to try to push our uh, revenue higher and try to continue to, to grow until we hit the break even point. Okay, thank you, Ahmad. Ammar, I want to get back to you and, and ask you, how do you feel angel investing has evolved over the past five years in Hira? And um, how, how do you find 
the investors? Are they still risk averse or uh, are they more open to it? Uh, what's their appetite like? Sorry, I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I said the overall investment landscape has improved in Iraq. I mean, if I look back um, 2015, I think there was no investment or no perspective happening. And things started, I would say, with 2018-19, uh, with basically tech ventures uh station promoting basically startup scene and i think with that the community has grown um and basically angel investors have uh, started to organize themselves uh like with the iraqi angel investor network um the outreach to angel investors uh, given through entities like yours as well as other development agencies has basically supported to bring the different stakeholders together to help startups actually to and entrepreneurs to formulate their ideas to incubate them and to begin actually to be ready even to start to ask for money uh, so it's not something you can basically do from day one you actually have to develop something you have to develop the idea the first proof of concept in order to be able to convince others to start investing money and to that. So I see that basically developing. I think also, as Ahmed is mentioning, is that uh, Iraq is coming slowly into the regional radars of other institutional investors and just uh, regional startups. And I think overall that is creating uh, an, uh, a very positive uh, environment. And um, the other thing what basically we should not underestimate is that startups generating other startups so um, what what I mean by that is that a lot of the entrepreneurs coming from other startups because they learned how a startup works they learned basically how to work with technologies and if you see basically they in cash as an incubated startup uh, a lot of Previous saying cash employees started their own startups and providing uh, services, right? And you see that basically across the board with Kareem. And so that's important that you have actually also those regional players coming in, creating basically those capabilities and then expanding it. So uh, being an entrepreneur is not you know, something you, you learn basically by reading books, it's something you have to live through. You have to basically, it's like a craftsmanship. Uh, you have to understand how that works, live in that uh, environment, and that's the best learning environment for you, in order than to, to basically be able to, to transform your ideas into a business. So what advice do you have for Iraqi entrepreneurs who are looking to raise investment? I mean, my my advice is if they have if they have not any work experience is to work with a startup, right? And see basically how that works, right? To apply to to some of those startups, uh, see uh, basically what is the, the setup, uh, how they organize themselves, how do they market, etc. There's a lot of basically skills which is important and that also gives them later on credibility so uh, so work is, is the best school uh, that's number one number two is to um, connect with one of the incubator programs which are existing with the development programs to get the, the fundamentals right uh, so one of the fundamentals is to develop a business plan which not about just putting a financial plan but creating and articulating the idea it's a value proposition the go-to-market approach etc and then able them to transform them into uh, into a, a winning pitch deck uh, as well as basically be able to create a first proof of concept so i think that's to get the basic uh, right uh, and number three uh, team up with like-minded um, entrepreneurs so it's always better uh, and 
uh, to work in a team with other partners uh, to share the risk, the effort, but also when it comes in later on in terms of the investment, investors are always looking to have for a strong team where the risk and the profiles are shared rather than just uh, looking at a one person company uh, who could basically, for whatever reasons, might not be able to continue. Right. And so if we have, let's say, two or three partners who basically have complementary skill sets, uh, um, can basically back each other, uh, each other, that's basically, um, it's good for them and it's more comfortable for investors. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Thank you, Ammar. Um, so, so, excuse me? Most welcome, thank you. So um, we still have a few minutes before starting the Q&A and I wanted to ask Ahmad, what advice do you have for Iraqi startups looking for investments within Iraq? Like first you need to develop your business model, uh, know your target audience and cust customer avatar, what, what is your niche and what is your focus in general. Um, um, your product or service, uh, the team is very important. Um, you have a projection that beside your uh, pitch deck that that it shows to the investors where you are going and, and what you're going to do with the money, how much you're going to invest in percentage wise in the team versus marketing versus other expenses, um, how your business model works. Is it capital intensive? Is it light? Uh, do you have an inventory you don't have? um you need to uh, it's it's as Ammar said like if you be incubated or like you know do an acceleration program like let's say I, we've done Tequeen one of the acceleration programs uh, like Tequeen or like um, scale up academy in in capita or uh, orange corner depending on the stage of your startup or al mahatta all those places they have or five one labs uh, or Oh, five one labs. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't need to market you. We are on five one. I sorry, I forgot that. Or five one labs. So, like, depending on the stage of your uh, of your startup, uh, there are several programs now, and it's it's way easier for you know the early stage startups in comparison with like you know the stage we started, uh, the period we started our startup. Uh, so, you know, networking with investors, net networking with with uh, uh, like minded entrepreneurs, uh, maybe, you you know, developing your team in terms of co-founding co team. Don't start alone. It's a very lonely journey and a journey and a very difficult and long journey. If you have good co-founders with you, it will be easier. Um, and it's also more appealing for investors because what they look at usually is the team, the product and the service, uh, the market is what you are developing in this market. Is it scalable or not? Um, those all or all these things. I apply for the Iraqi Angel Network, apply for the Iraqi Venture Partners. Uh, those are the two networks now uh, that like you know receive applications. Uh, try to pitch. The more you pitch, the more you improve your skills in terms of modifying your pitch, modifying your pitch deck, uh, learning from when the investors grill you, you learn more about like uh, how to answer or what to add, what's missing. Uh, you learn different ideas and perspective. Uh, you can learn from them. So all these factors like very important to uh, to raise capital also like you know to try to get some grants from uh, there is this a new carp uh, program um when you win some of the acceleration programs they give you a grant without an exchange for equity like the queen gave us a grant uh, and some other programs also give some grants those also can help uh you know uh, kick start your, your your journey and ignite and scale um, the more you can prove your uh, model or like you have revenue, the easier you raise capital. So if you are just in an idea, it's more difficult to validate it and to convince investors. Like for Orisdi, we were post-revenue since day one. Uh, uh, but that's not always when easy when you have a service startup because usually selling products are way easier than selling services. So it depends on your model. model. If you are a B2B, B2C, um, yeah, all these factors, like in general. 
Um, so we're going to open now the, the conversation with, uh, with, with the audience. And we have someone who asks a question for Ammar. As an angel investor, what is the size of the ticket that you provide startups? Uh, so me personally or in general, uh, I'll, let me try and answer basically both. So I think usually I'm looking at size anywhere from uh, 25,000 to probably 100,000. Uh, angel investments uh, are also an, around that area. Uh, I think there are investors who might basically invest lower than 25,000, but I would basically call them as angel investors. So that might be basically some private investors, but uh, below that amount, you actually, it's not worthwhile for you to spend significant time with the company, right? And above 100,000 uh, is more than exceptions as an angel investors has happened out, but, uh, also, but I think that's probably uh, I would say less than 10% of angel investments happening about above that amount. Yeah. We have Ammar Dauria asking Ahmad, recently you got the bridge financing round, but it was from 13 investors. Can you tell us about the share you sacrificed from your company? I think the number of investors were less, but uh, uh, we it depends on the round like with as you go with the rounds you lose equity but like example last round i didn't lose much equity because i i invested a lot in the round as well i didn't like i was not i i was part like i was also participating in the round to kind of pre pre uh, protect my equity from dilution so um i i didn't get diluted a lot uh in the last route particularly but of course since the beginning of the startup i did uh, like my equity went down uh, in comparison with now Ahmad has another question but we have other people so Ahmad, i'm just i'll try to get back to you later um so somebody's asking what's the best way to start a business is it by depending on your own self or by angel investing? And which one is less riskier? Sorry, that question is to Ahmed or to, to me? Uh, this one, whoever would like to answer. I'll go, I'll, I'll answer the question. If you don't mind, I'm more. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's uh, if you have investors you can you can probably scale beyond your financial capabilities depending on the size of the startups but like uh, having investors is also a big responsibility you have to manage the investors you have to answer to the investors you have to report to the investors uh, and it's not it's it's an extra uh, like you know it will take from your time and effort and 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 uh, and also, if you if you can start a startup without an investment, it's definitely uh, you have more freedom, you have more equity, you have less probably issues like you know you 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 are the decision maker. But once you onboard investors, you are responsible for those shareholders, and you have to you have a board. Uh, like you know, you lose you lose control of the company with time, and you have to. Uh, you know, have like a, a certain governance to, to manage the company to answer in certain ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's there is no clear answer for both things. Like you know, you you can do it. Um, you can uh, you can. Hmm. Yeah. So you you. Sorry for that. Apologies. So you no can you can have you can have the just hold on a second. Sorry. Oh, 
Okay, well, we... there was another question. Um, are there any, oh, Ahmad, you're back. I apologize. Yeah, I apologize no, for that. So basically, it, it depends on it depends on uh, your startup and how much money you need. Like if you are a software company, it's not like when you are an e-commerce company. Uh, maybe things are easier when you are not attached to a certain physical products in comparison with digital products. Um, so if you can start your startup without funding, it's great. And if you can get it into profitability, maybe you can raise bigger ticket later on uh, without uh, you know i mean when you are not profitable so it depends it depends on the startup but like you cannot scale to a big level without investment like if you look at uh, bull gates now owns one percent of microsoft but it's worth billions of dollars because the company grew to a certain level and all those big companies that you hear about like meta or microsoft or or uh, Apple, they all raise capital to reach to that level from private company to a public company. And, and that's the sequence. But like this, uh, this culture is not, it's not, it's a new for Iraq. It's, it's difficult. Most Iraqis are one man show, man, uh, traders and merchants, and they don't want to have other partners and they don't understand how the governance work or how the board, board works in general um so yeah that's the answer so there's somebody called Haider Karim and he's asking are there any business centers in our country that offer data ideas solutions and contacts to help entrepreneurs build successful businesses and what steps can we take to provide such resources for our business community so I feel you sort of answered that question and you gave like a comprehensive list of uh, incubators and accelerators that are very helpful for startups. But is there anything else you would like to add? Sorry, the question to me? Oh, you and Ammar, whoever would like. They're asking about business centers that in the country that uh, offer ideas and solutions and contacts to help entrepreneurs. No, but I think we, we mentioned, and I think uh, as a, you can add to that list probably is the best, right? In terms of existing uh, um, accelerators and startup programs. But I think, uh, as Ahmed said, from uh, Iraq Angel Investor Networks to Orange Corner to uh, Five Point Labs yeah. Station. Uh, so there are many uh, which you can find and they are growing. Uh, um, Thanks, Scott. Uh, and so, yeah. So I guess this next question maybe could be addressed by Ahmad and Ammar. And the question is, how did you value your startup and what was the method you used? There are different valuation uh, methods, like it could be multiples of revenue, it could be uh, you know, it, each as I said, like before, each round we had different approach. Like usually, uh, when you start, it's multiple of a revenue. You cannot like use cash discount cash flow because you're not profitable. It's not more used for traditional businesses, but it's still you can use it for tech startup if you have approach for five to ten years. Um, but mostly we were dependent. Uh, I would say if we if, if if we just recall most of the rounds, mostly we're like some kind of multiples of revenue uh, beside like you know evaluating the the, the gross margins uh, the efficiency of the company the burn rate and the scale the the potential to scale and uh, i'm not if you'd like to add some of the things that i forgot probably sure uh, so i i think um, the multiples is one element probably the the easier one just in order to have comparables uh, but whenever we are looking on valuation they need to be backed up by business prospects teams and let's uh, strategic assets of the company uh, besides let, uh, multiple uh, usually you can also uh, um, utilize discounted cash flows so looking basically in terms of 
future prospects and um, evaluate the net present value for that investment, either in an overall going concern scenario or an exit scenario for a VC. Um, that's basically the main two options which are used for the valuation. And I think also in Oresti's case, where they uh, engaged external evaluator, they basically also looked on both, uh, both options in order to come up with the recommended valuation. Okay. And I, uh, I think, let's say, uh, sorry to add, and what we basically did probably in the last bridge round is we, we included also the market pricing mechanisms to come up with the correct valuation. Because I think, especially as a young startup, if you are concerned, there's a long debate on what is the right value. And uh, one way to do that is basically you, you create a market mechanism uh, between supply and demand to come to what actually the market see as the right valuation. Yeah, as Ammar said, like in the last round, uh, we didn't go with uh, what we think is the real valuation of the company, but we just opened it and, and we received some investments uh, because we, you just have to continue to 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 move on, like uh, grow and, you know, uh, pay for the expenses and continue to to on your plan. So not necessarily everything what's going on in Iraq, in my opinion, as a startup founder is fair, but that's how things are uh, going on in general. Like you have to just go with, uh, with what's like what the market is, 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 is forcing on you. Like, you know, and, uh, yeah, I mean, those are the methods that we used in general. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure, um, startups in Iraq need to correct for, their their valuation for the Iraqi market, you wouldn't be valued, unfortunately, the same as a Dubai-based uh, startup. Um, okay, we have another question. I always wanted to own my own business, but I don't know how to start. Could you ex please explain the first steps of a startup business. So this is a really, uh, would require a really long answer, but I guess um, if you could share with us, I don't know, three top points for this. A team, uh, product or service, your business model, and is it scalable what you are doing or not? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, team like to find the right co-founding team uh, the the product and service what are you offering and who's your target audience is it scalable what you are doing it can be is it only focused on Iraq or it can be scaled outside of the software uh, because that also can re reduce the difficulty of raising capital so let's say if you're a SaaS software company it's a global solution you can raise capital maybe in Silicon Valley but if you are only focused on Iraq, you're limited to the geography of Iraq in terms of investment. Um, yeah, and the market. So market, team, uh, product and service, and scalability. Business model. <laughs> OK. Great. Um, we also have a question from Zahra. Mr. Ahmed, how did you convince Iraq angel investors to invest in Oristi at your first round? Unfortunately, some of the Iraqi investors are traditional and not willing to take the risk, although the Iraqi market is hungry for business. In the first round, you try to go for like we call it the threes, like three Fs, which is family, friends, and fools. Like, you know, try to go to the uh, close people to you, to people who trust you, know you very well. Uh, probably you don't need that much big amount at the beginning. Uh, so try to go f to family and friends and, and, and raise some amount. Like we raised it uh, from very small amount from two uh small angel investors uh, at the beginning in 2019. Um, I think now in Iraq, you can raise a bigger amount than that amount in general, uh, because it's it's way easier or you can get a grant for that. Uh, so always, I would say start small, but think big. Um, so 
So as a startup, how long can you expect to gain high uh, and expected profits? Months or years? Usually years, but but some startups were profitable from the beginning. But uh, so it depends on so many variables, like how you're going to do it, which market, what's your focus, what's your niche. Uh, the more focused on a specific niche, the easier you can get into profitability than going broad. And it depends on the sector, like the e-commerce sector, probably more difficult than the SaaS sectors in certain variables or like um, food delivery sector is has some different difficulties. So it depends on so many different variables. So I'm gonna take one more last question because we are near the end of our time. And it's again from a gentleman called Ammar. The Iraqi market is not a cheap market, salaries and marketing and also sales channels. So how will you manage the company with a small amount of 220,000 for 13 board members? They are not all board members, the, the, the investors, but like we, our board is uh, consists of five seats and uh, we have four board members. Um, and we have some roles to get the board members. But like, yeah, I mean, it's a valid question. How you manage the company, you have to be super efficient. Like you have to spend only on the right things. Uh, our cost of technology is low in general because we use a ready platform and we developed on it. Uh, our team is very efficient. We have big part of the team working online uh, based on performance and not salaries. Uh, and some part of the team works on salary. So you have to optimize 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 every different every single angle in the, of the business to try to get as efficient as possible and we are the most efficient e-commerce store in iraq in in terms of units of economics not in terms of size but um, and and that's why we believe we can get into profitability very soon um, so it's not easy but it's 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 not impossible Thank you so much, Ammar and Ahmad. It's our time right now, and we have to we have to close off our amazing and very interesting webinar. I'm sorry if we didn't get to answer everybody's questions, but um, hopefully next time. And uh, congratulations again, Ammar and Ahmad, for the latest raise. And uh, can't wait to hear more uh, interesting news and and more success from Aristi. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.